purchasing of knives is really, it has to strike me and it, it comes very rarely. But that's because that itch is scratched every afternoon. Mm. These knives come to my door. I get to own them for two, three days a week, handle them. I, I photograph them. I inspect them. They're mine for a little while. Right. And then I ship them back away. And, and the glory is I don't have to purchase that knife to enjoy it. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 86 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the podcast. Episode 86, as I said, of the Knife Junkie Podcast. It's our weekly interview show, the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting. And we get a chance on the interview show to hear Bob talk to knife designers, knife makers, manufacturers, knife reviewers, anyone who loves knives. And Bob, not that this isn't a knife lover, but this is a, a different twist, if you will, for our interview show today. It's not a knife maker, not a yeah. designer, but a knife photographer. That's right. Interesting. The, yeah. yeah, yeah. The preeminent knife photographer in the in the business right now, Jim Cooper. He's known as uh, Sharp by Coop. You'll see that watermark on his photography, which is very identifiable. Uh, he has definitely his own style, and it has become... Uh, the way to photograph knives for merchandising. The way he sets up his photography, uh, the viewer can sort of see the whole knife as if they're holding it in their hands. But we'll get to that later. Sharp by Coop, his, his photography, uh, you know, makes me drool for these knives. So, yeah. Well, and that's the reason he photographs them for makers and manufacturers, because they want you to drool over them to buy them. So. Exactly. I mean, it's a visual thing. If you can't be in a knife shop, and not too many of us have custom knife shops in our neighborhood, if you can't be there holding it and, uh, you know, inspecting it, you can do so through these photographs. Plus, they're just beautifully and artfully uh, arranged, lit, and shot. Well, speaking about, uh, I think you said merchandise, uh, that type of thing, a uh, couple of uh, pages that we'd like for you to visit on the Knife Junkie website before you get into the interview, thenifejunkie.com slash knives. That's a uh, page that we have that has some of the most recent knives for sale from some of our affiliate relationships with uh, companies not like Knives, Ship Free, etc. That's thenifejunkie.com slash knives. But we've also created a uh, merchandise area on the website, the knifejunkie.com slash shop. You can get your Knife Junkie merchandise as well as other knife-related shirts and hats and mugs and all that kind of stuff at the knifejunkie.com slash shop. I'll tell you what I'm getting first, Jim. I'm getting the uh, sort of baseball t-shirts, the three-quarter length sleeve t-shirts that I used to wear in the 70s and 80s as a little kid bombing around the neighborhood. Well, I can wear one of those now with the with the Knife Junkie logo on it or uh, don't take dull for an answer on the front. And I love them. Jim, you did a beautiful job designing all this stuff. Definitely check it out. Thank you, sir. The KnifeJunkie.com slash shop if you'd like to go uh, check out and look and see what we're talking about. So what do you say we get into that interview with Jim Cooper, Sharp by Coop, right now? Let's do it. Got a question or comment? Call the Knife Junkies listener line at 724-466-4487. I'm here with Jim Cooper, or as you may know him, Sharp by Coop, the preeminent knife photographer out there in the knife world, and I'm honored to have him on the Knife Junkie. Uh, Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Bob. Thank you to your listeners for listening. Uh, you know, it's funny. I realized, I remember realizing at one point that all of these amazing knife pictures with the sort of well, all these amazing knife pictures that have a signature sort of style to them are all coming from the same place. I started looking at the watermark down, uh, you know, on the on the uh, bottom right or whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. I, I just, uh, wow, this guy really knows how to photograph knives and seems to have a passion for it. Why knives, Jim? You're obviously a talented photographer. Uh, just explain your path to this uh, this position here. Thanks for asking. And um. And I want you to ask me about that logo at some point because it's a little interesting there that it's, uh, about how that evolved. I will. In regards to you know, I, you claim I'm a good photographer. Well, I'm a, I'm a, I am a pretty good photographer of other things, but I'm a very good photographer of knives. Uh, that's my specialty. I and I often tell people I'm a big fish in a small pond. 
<laughs> because when you mention that you're a professional photographer, everybody says, well, my cousin does weddings and this, but uh, I, I, pff, not me. You know, I photograph metal objects uh, and, and, and that's what I focus on. So I'm a specialist in that regard. So, uh, why, why knives? Do you have a personal love? I mean, it's obvious you have some sort of personal affinity. How did you discover that? Well, no different than you. I started, the photography came after my love of knives. And I was very fortunate in the late nineties. I, my brother-in-law, his name is James Ciello. He, uh, he moved out to Arizona and he partnered with a fellow and, um, they, he was a really talented machinist and him and James Lozon, uh, created something called James Brothers. And it was a, uh, an automatic folder they made out of CNC aluminum and spring loaded. It was fast as heck. <laughs> um, and uh, he, he'd been working in a machine shop and all of a sudden he, he shipped me uh, a gift. Um, he said, check out what I'm making now. And it was this kick ass spring loaded automatic. And I was like, whoa, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> And he said, yeah, we'll market them. They're about $250. And I just about fell off my chair. <laughs> <laughs> really? A knife that costs $250? Well, to a non-knife person, that sounds like a lot. Yeah. They went on to for a number of years. Uh, it, it, it ended up being Desert Knife Works after it was uh, uh, James Brothers. And they made a, a model called a Cheyenne. Some of your longtime listeners may know this. Uh, they stopped making them um, probably in early 2000s, but um, I still have a one or two. But it was that knife, that automatic knife that worked so well and was so lethal. Uh, you know, when we talk about an automatic, it's a switchblade, you know, mm -hmm. non, you know. And so that that cemented my stature. And so then it, I asked him, could I get a couple more? And so I purchased a few and I gave him his wedding gifts and I gave him to my best friend and and, uh, and 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 it grew from there. I could keep going, but I'll, I'll let you. Well, just were were they illegal at the point you're, <laughs> at this time? Who, who in, knows? In Connecticut or wherever you were? <laughs> of course, they probably. <laughs> st <laughs> oh, you think I, you know? Do you stop completely at every stop sign? I know that's that's the thing. I'm like, you know, luckily I don't get in too many dust ups with the cops. So right. you know, right. if if on occasion I venture out with a with a, an automatic knife, ah, so be it. Yeah, uh, among friends, among exactly. Friends. <laughs> so you you have this automatic knife uh, from the James Brothers, and and is that when you decided, geez, I need to take a picture of this thing? It's so compelling. No, one of my friends was a uh, was uh, come to find out he be he belongs with me in a local rowing club that I belong to, and um, I showed him this, and he goes, "Well, did you know that I collect knives?" I said, "No," and he collects a bunch of old traditional, you know, grandpa's pocket knife. He must have. 30 of them. I was like, whoa. So he invited me over and we opened and closed them. And I ended up getting him one of those knives. Guess what? He's, he's my, my best man at my wedding uh, three years later. So we really built a friendship. He said, by the way, I'm going to a, sh a, a show, a local show up in Waterbury, Connecticut, about uh, 45 minutes away. And it's on a Sunday. And would you join me? Yeah. Wow. That sounds really cool. So I, I did. I went up there and I, I wandered around and I was just, you know, the first time you ever go to a real knife show, you just can't believe what you're seeing. And it's so focused. You know, look at the smile on your face. I know it. <laughs> and um, I ended up leaving there with a $35 Columbia River Knife and Tool Kiss folder. You know, that yep, folder. Yeah, I know that, exactly. It's the <laughs> ubiquitous folder. It's got one side, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. And I don't, that was all I spent that day. But the but was that, boy, did I love... Uh, all that stuff there. And I'm going to tell you the, the second portion of the story. I, I stopped at a custom purveyor, and it was a woman, Graziana Shaw. And she had a host of custom knives in her case. And one in particular, oh, it was so beautiful. It looked like a bird with wings, and it had a claw beak. And it was the most beautiful knife. And I called my buddy from the other side. I said, you got to come over here. Well, it was a Wolfgang Lorkner. Wings folder. Wolfgang Lochner in the custom knife world is the top five most renowned custom knife builder. He does it all with files and stuff. The most wow. beautiful folder. And I said, what does this cost? She says, it's $2,800. Wow. I was like, oh my God. Yeah, that, yeah, it was unobtained. Well, guess what? That knife now is I said 2800 uh -huh. That knife is easily $28,000. Whoa. Yeah. They talk what? about an investment. Yeah. 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 
and and his work is continues to be renowned. And I love the man, and I love his knives. Uh, uh, but I'll never forget that part- that one particular knife was so beautiful. Um, Google Bird Wings Lorkner, L O R L O E R C H. It's not Lorchner, as I thought for so many years. It's Lorkner because he right. pronounces yeah. that way. Okay. But the wings folder from Wolfgang Lorch Lorchner Lorkner. It's, uh, that cemented it. That was it. I just had to get involved in custom knives. So, uh, it was that the moment you started building your, uh, okay. So your, your roster is amazing. The people yeah. that you've yeah. photographed, uh, you know, it is a literal who's who and, uh, and counting, you know, there, there are going to be more people, you know, constantly coming to you because of how you, how you do this. Um, who, who are some of the people you photographed? Like you, like your most, the ones you're the, 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 craziest about the proudest about um wolfgang lorkner would probably top the list uh, because i've met him and he's a personal friend michael walker i'm gonna ah. my top five names that i say when this and i'm talking about custom knives mm-hmm. these are makers that are or knives are, are sell upwards of 10 grand well upwards of 10 grand so wolfgang lorkner ron lake Ron Lake just sent me brownies and pickles for Christmas as a gift. <laughs> this is the friendship that we have. It That's cool. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, Michael Walker. There's a, a European fellow named um, Jürgen Steinau. Jürgen, J-E-R, Jürgen Steinau. His work is impeccable and it's beautiful and it's unobtaining in the $20,000 minimum. Jeez. Right? Yeah. And um, Ron Appleton, or Riz, uh, Ron Appleton is Ray Appleton's son. His work is just it, it, it's maybe he makes five pieces a year and every one of them is over 20 grand. Mm-hmm. Um, the one maker who I'd love to meet and we all know about, and he's setting the world on fire with his, his knives is Bob Kramer. Oh, right. The, the chef knife, uh, man. Yeah. And I've never photographed a Bob Kramer knife, but if I was to tell you who's the five, top six most collectible knife makers in the world, Kramer would have to be there. I mean, his knives, he, look, hey, one of his used knives just auctioned for, Twenty three, two hundred thirty thousand dollars. Oh you my heard about God! That. I, I did not hear about that. Oh, uh, yeah, his chef knife that he had made personally for Anthony Bourdain. Oh. You know the chef on TV. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, he, he, uh, yeah. he died, and um, so his estate that knife went up for sale. It was Anthony Bourdain's personal knife from wow that from Bob Kramer. At any rate, so it was auctioned, and it went for an astronomical two hundred thirty thousand dollars. So there you go. Wow. So okay, so how how has floating around in this rarefied air uh, uh, affected your taste in knives or your your collection? I'm assuming you have an amazing collection. I don't I don't mean to be presumptuous, but I I, I can't help but imagine you have a sweet collection. Oh, you're 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 correct, and I probably I've probably owned 150 handmade knives, custom knives over the course of time. But I, right now, I probably own. 50 to 60. You know how it is. Knives, they come, they go. Here's the phrase that I use uh, now. I, my purchasing of knives is really, it has to strike me and it, it comes very rarely. But that's because that itch is scratched every afternoon. Mm. These knives come to my door. I get to own them for two, three days a week, handle them. I, I photograph them. I inspect them. They're mine for a little while. Right. And then I ship them back away. And, and the glory is I don't have to purchase that knife to enjoy it. This is something that, I mean, you are in such an enviable <laughs> spot because this is a, a common theme that just keeps coming up. I'm like, I, I act as if I'm a curator in the uh, Bob DeMarco Knife Museum, and it takes a lot of discipline for me to, to, to unload knives because there's something about each one that I have that I that I love. And I'm way down there in the production world. I have a couple of customs, but, you know, so, I mean, these are things that uh, – uh, are, pres- are are you would assume way less hard to get attached to because they're production, they're run of the mill, if you will, you know. And some of them I customize or this or that. But trying to sell some amazing work of knife art that you have, I, I can't, you know, can't fathom that. Well, you know, there is an intrinsic value to the human that's behind uh, those individual makers, and and by all means, they uh, that's inescapable and it's real. There's a however, though, and the however is there's humans behind those factory knives. There's mm-hmm. people that designed it. There's people that are making it, making their living with those knives, and they're, you know, so you can't just say it's just a production knife. It's it's not spending spit out of a machine without some type of no, no. interaction with the knife community. So it's it's making people happy. 
But uh, boy, there's nothing like uh, supporting some maker in their little garage shop and uh, and what they're doing. And yeah. and if you've had one on one interactions with a person, just like you and I are right now, you, you feel some bond. Yeah, you feel some bond. So um, you know the handful of customs that you have. I'm sure if you've met those makers, you're like, oh, I'm never letting this thing go. Yes, this is, uh, this exactly. is mine. <laughs> That's exactly right. And one of them I got to pick up in in his very shop, and that was that was a great experience too. Bravo. Uh, so. So you, you're in this enviable position of being able to sample and review all of these amazing blades as they come in for you to photograph and send out. What have you learned in handling all of these masterpieces about oh about your own taste in knives and also where where the knife world is is kind of going and what people are into right now? Yeah, I get a huge variety, and um, certainly I've seen the utmost in quality. So I'm, I've got a pretty distinct eye. As to what uh, you know, what is is really good and close. Um, that said, not everybody makes. Not everybody's trying to shoot for the most precision, the tightest fit, the most perfection. One of my friend, a friend, he's uh, he, he's out. He's one of the nicest guys I've ever met, Pete Prime, out in Oregon, and um, his knives are without question rough, hmm. rough. He sells every single one. Because I think his clients that come up to his table love him. They like his knives. It's no question it's a handmade knife because this doesn't, the scale is a little fatter on this side than that side. And, uh, you know, I, and, and, and Pete, if you're out there, forgive me, but I love you. But I, you know, I just use you as an example. I, I, I'm so impressed that every time I, his work got published on a cover of Knives Illustrated, Knives Annual, and he sells everything. So it's just like, so there's a nice example of Wolfgang Lortner. And, uh, or Jurgen Steinau, this stuff is so precise, you can yeah, take it down yeah. to a microscopic level. This other gentleman's, uh, it's the beauty of imperfection that, that. Yeah. 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 There you go. You, you nailed it. So there's, there runs the gamut. So the knife comes to your door. Some amazing, uh, knife comes to your door. Tell me about your process. Ex- explain that. What do you go through and how do you figure out how to shoot these? And then, and then talk about your style. You have sort of a triptych style. T- tell mm-hmm. me about that. Oh, uh, good. Uh, thank you for asking. That's important. I'm going to tell you that I've learned that my knife photography is four parts, four equal parts. And the f- the first one is the actual shooting and capturing of the knife. As my job is sh- and, and capturing under the light, and I'll talk about that in a second. But that's that's the shooting. I can do that at a show. I do it in my studio, and uh, there's work involved with that: mirrors, lights, all that stuff. That size. The second part is I take uh, those files, and I disappear up two floors up to my office. Where we're interviewing and I, uh, I edit them through a big iMac display and, uh, and Photoshop. And I spend time merging and your viewers. If they know my work, go, go to knifegallery.com and you'll see all and everything that I've ever done. Three images, like you said, triptych. There's usually two or three images of the same knife and I edit them. So that, there's the shooting and then the editing. Mm. The inescapable part of, of what I do is I'm also a shipping company. I'm a shipping department. <laughs> yeah. Every knife that comes in comes in a cardboard box. I got to separate. I got to spend. I spend a lot of time in unpacking and putting aside. I print and then I've got to rebox everything and I've got to label. And so I'm a shipping department. I'm a, you know, that's the, yeah. that's the, the low end of this. And the final um, portion that is just as important, maybe the most important, is all the communication that I do with the client and ultimately to get that knife in the hands of editors and to uh, on f- Facebook, on my Instagram, you know, all that stuff behind the scenes to, to uh, dialogue, communication and typing. So those four things you know, are the biggest aspects and you can't do it without all four, all four of them. They're all equal. Well, why do, why do makers send their knives to you in particular? I've developed my style that is very visual. It's a single image. Uh, I'll talk. Uh, first, let me just tell why I, a single image, um, a composite image, and photography in general is still and will always be here to stay. The podcast we're listening to right now is dynamic. It's moving. Videos are dynamic. They're moving. You have to hit the pause button if you and you can back up. You can, but but it's it's constantly moving. So you gotta you gotta kind of pay attention. 
a single image, a photograph, whether a magazine or on your computer screen, your phone, you can take your time and you can study it and you, you go at your own pace and you can come back to it, back to it, and it's there, it's not shifting, you can really spend your time. So there'll always be a, an opportunity, there'll always be a place for single images because it's, it's just the most calm way to view something and stable. The composite image thing that I do, and I won't lay claim that I invented this, uh, this format. Um, I probably did, Eric Eggley from Point Seven was probably the first one that I saw do it and others in the early 2000s. Uh, and everybody's doing some form of it. Um, I've certainly capitalized on this display format, but the great thing about these composite images is that you don't have to shift from one. If you're on a computer, you click out of one image, mm -hmm. you click out, and you go to another image, and you click out. Yeah. We've all been to the websites, and you click out. They've got six shots, and they're all you click in, you click out. Whereas I like looking at a single image, and you scan around it, and you go, oh, look at the back spine. Look at the close side. And, and I'll point out that I always shoot, I call it my core view, which is the knife that's open or the fixed blade that's in, in a, usually it's in a diagonal from upper right, uh, right down to left. Just that's to seen. maximize your space. Yeah. yeah. So, and then the, then if it's a folder, you want to show the other side of the folder. You want to show what the folder looks like closed. And then, of course, the back spine of a folder is generally some area of some cool stuff. Yes, yes. So, if you can incorporate the back spine, the closed view, the other side of the knife and the main view, you've got four big ingredients for the, you got 95% of the knife in one rectangle. Right. It's almost like you're holding it in your hand, turning it uh, around. Yeah. That's why it's effective because people, ah, oh, I just, I just like to, you know, there's knives are long and thin. So you have all this extra real estate around it. Mm -hmm. If you put it in a rectangle, no matter how you shoot it, it's always going to be a rectangle. It's long and thin. So you've got these triangles on either side. That's either dead space or you can fill it with stuff. And truth is, am I guilty of sometimes overfilling that bottle? Yeah, me, me and everybody else. But what, what are you filling it with? Uh, uh, another high-definition image of this yeah. knife that someone might be interested in buying. You mentioned the stillness of it. And you know, I can still see pictures. We have this old weapons book that my brother and I used to fight over when we were kids. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I still have a, a version of that now here, a, a modern, uh, uh, edition of it. And I can look at these, uh, pictures, these images, and I can remember them from yeah. just staring at them when I was, you know, 10 years old. I can remember yeah. them. There's, there is something about a still image. And then by putting those other aspects of the knife in that same image, you're kind of given the, the effect of, a moving picture because you're able to look right. at the handle from the side and then right. from the from the spine side and get the contours and stuff like that. I notice you usually put the point like especially if it's a, a sword or something. Sometimes you'll you'll show the hilt and and then the 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 tip and then the and then the back and you just kind of get an impression of the whole knife. I often say to people, I say, you know, usually when we look at a, a, at a knife, a custom knife usually is what I'm photographing, but any knife you look at it. Quickly on a, a side view, that's the core view, but the first thing you do is you pull it up to your eye. You start looking closely at the <laughs> details. We love we love the details yeah. because that's where the mechanics lie. That's where all the, the little stuff, and, uh, It's it, there's intricacy that's hidden. So the overall shape of the knife has to be pleasing, and we like that. But boy, th and then we draw it up. And th so that's where I, I'd like to think I excel is I try to show those details that the people – if they had it in their hand, where would they turn it? How would they roll it? They would want to look at this and that and go, oh, look at that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. So as someone who has knives and has photographed them and taken video of them and, uh, you know, I've, I've photographed for Instagram, look at my new knife kind of thing. Yeah. Um, it's not it's not easy, <laughs> especially if you're just doing it on an iPhone. But I, I look at your fo uh, photography and after I'm done drooling over the knife that you've so, you know, nicely captured, uh, I'm, I'm struck by the light. You know, you, you have amazing, even light. And and that's so great for showing off details like, uh, you know, in materials and that kind of thing. Uh, explain how you how you uh, use light so well. Good. Yeah, it's, it's a very valid question. Um, I learned long ago that 
the best way to photograph these knives is to have them shoot them with a diffuser background. Uh, your viewers must have seen some type of light tent. Uh, mine is literally on an angle, 45 degree angle from the back of my table up to the top of my head. And it's a diffuser material. You can buy it specially. Uh, you can buy it at an artist supply store. It's Draftsman's Vellum. Hmm. So I like to state that it's, you need you need three light sources to get the quality image that I have. Three light sources. One is an overall abundant light source that lights the whole knife itself. And uh, and usually that's the one that I position so that the blade itself is is the right temperament, the right brightness. Hmm. So it can't be too bright. It depends. If it's a Damascus blade, it's, you're going to brighten the heck out of it. But if it's a shiny, mm -hmm. polished blade, hello, you're going to turn, turn it down a little. The second light, this is the important thing, is, is a much smaller focused beam. And if you look closely at my uh, my images, you'll see that I always point a lot, probably get 30% more light at the handle. Hmm. Handles are always a light absorbing material. Usually, like, especially on a fixed blade, right. there's always something, you know, the blade is shiny, and then the, the hardest thing to photograph is a dark handled, yeah. shiny blade. <laughs> My or, yeah. or yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it, so you gotta, so you, you turn it up on one end, and you turn it down on the other. And so oh. if you have two light sources, you can, you can, you can meet that. And then you play a little bit in Photoshop too, uh, uh, which is not a sin. As a matter of fact, Photoshop is, is a wonderful tool that, uh, it's only a sin if you're a Luddite. <laughs> <laughs> right. But two light sources. Now, where's that third light source? You know, I'm just identifying. I got one yeah. big one, and then I got the sh a small one, and they're both behind the diffuser. They're coming in from behind. They're coming on the knife, pointing kind of at me. Well, I have an array of reflectors, and they're literally plexiglass mirrors. If you've seen pictures of my work uh, setup, you will see that I've got all these mirrors that you can throw around. And if you look at one of the a fixed blade or any of the thing, you'll see a highlight on the inside of the knife. You'll see a highlight, a light beam that's, uh, that shows the, the handle contours. And that's always that third light source, which is reflected light. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's, it's reflected from the other two. And by angling that mirror, and I, I angle it up and down and any number of ways you can, you can position that light and really I call it it's fill lighting. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. That's why the knife is always very clear. Because otherwise, you get that big, bright light at the coming on it. Without that fill light, you got a big, deep shadow. Right. And you're going to get flares on the blade and stuff. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, it's from, from an extreme novice's point of view, when you're shooting uh, um, something with a, a, you know, a hollow grind and a, and a, yep. and a uh, what do you call it? Like a satin finish kind of. It you know you want to show all of the contours of that blade, but then it starts to 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 blow out the like you said the handle material and everything else. So you got a comp that's interesting. So you have a light handle or a, a handle light. Like, yes, I love that. You were mentioning before, and and I have to ask because uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't. Uh, you mentioned how you're a shipping a shipping agency as well, and you're constantly shipping department. The shipping department. You're constantly opening up boxes. What are you doing it with? I know you're not using a you're not using a a beautiful bird wing. No, well, I uh, no, I, I'd like to. I have a. Uh, it, it is a handmade knife. It's it was uh, it was given to me. I it's a friction folder. Yeah, uh, that's my my main choice. A friction folder, and it's by um, a gentleman named Harbir Shalal, who is uh, now making knives in in in, in uh, Arizona, and he's making chef's knives. But he made a uh, he made a folder, a friction folder, uh, and and. I approached him a few years ago, and I just said I, I liked him. I went out to dinner with him once. He's just a well-spoken guy, not a big maker at all, but uh, I just liked him enough. I said I'd like, I need a knife, and and this, and you just nailed it. What do I use a knife for? I'll tell you what. Ninety percent of the time that I need a knife is for opening cardboard boxes. Right. <laughs> I mean, I'm just we're product oriented, and me, that's all I need. So I need a cardboard knife box. So, um, <laughs> a cardboard box, box knife. knife yeah. yeah. Well, so, so why, okay. All right. So then, then what is it? Why? Okay. You mentioned 90% of everything we do is, is, uh, could, opening packages. Yeah. It yeah. could be covered with a small <laughs> clip joint. But what is, so what is our fascination with, with ever more, uh, you know, ex I'm not even getting into price, but ever, ever more innovative folding knives, for instance, ever more, uh, beautiful fixed blades with, with exotic materials. 
it's not pure materialism, but it's also not art because it can be used. What is it? What is our fascination with these things? You know, funny, I wrote some notes down and I was going to send them to you, but I didn't. But I hear and, and, and it says right here, why are knives appealing? That's so I was hoping you'd ask me. And what is it? And first from the first word I use is they're sinister. They are primarily used to cut flesh, not cardboard. They were designed to cut flesh. Oh, whoa. That's <laughs> stand clear of the closing doors. Um, you know, and so so that said, we know that that's why you have to apologize sometimes to people when you, I tell people I shoot handmade knives they take they go oh that's nice as they take a step back <laughs> <laughs> there's there's just something very sinister about that um but that said we like risk we're, those of us that like knives are we're not very real conservative we like a little bit of risk we're a little challenging so there i like that sinister uh thing the, the second thing is anybody that has a good sense of uh engineering and design skills you can study a knife and go wow look at look at the way that was manufactured and i love engineering folding knives are abundant with engineering with the locking and the fold all the billions of things that go on there but they're not limited to folding knives but the mechanics are so appealing there's just there's so much appeal and it's sinister but yet there's mechanics involved engineering and then we look and we look at the skill of the uh, whether it's a production knife um the whether it's a handmade knife, it's, you know, how, how wonderful did this person make it? Uh, or did they, did they leave file marks in it just to show that it's handmade or is it polished to the nth degree? And, um, the last two notes I wrote here is just simply that because they're dangerous mm -hmm. and yet they're artful. Yes. Yes. That artful, especially the, the, the knives you're shooting. I would, I would yes. also say that, uh, w at least with some knives, the, the, the curviness, it's kind of anthropomorphic. It might be kind of remind us of humans or remind us of, you know, women or whatever, you know, just, just the, the curves might do. And also it's primitive. It was the very first tool. And, and, and right. there's probably something by this point that's in our epigenetics that just like draws into it. Just like there are things that push us away from snakes, you know, make us recoil from snakes. <laughs> there's something that draws us to the blade. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I, I'm like you. I just, I just find it appealing. Who doesn't like just opening and closing some folder that's well designed? It comes yeah. clack. Yeah. Uh, oh, there's just something about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, that's, that's the same kind of appeal that, uh, that guns have for me, though I'm way, way, way less a gun guy than a knife guy. But I, you know, I like to shoot. It's fun, but I also really appreciate the, the mechanism, the oh. machining, you know, it's, it's just beautiful. So in your so how many years have you would you consider yourself uh, a denizen of the knife world if you will twenty twenty okay. yeah I started I started in nineteen ninety nine so here we go so, so in those twenty years yeah tell me like what the trends you've seen and like in in big arcs what the trends have been and and kind of give me your your opinion the thing that, the two things and, and you know everybody is talking about the, the We'll call it tactical. Mm -hmm. That started in that started even before I came in. Apparently, the nineties. Um, that has grown. Everybody said, "Oh, the tactical market. It's a bubble. It's going to blow up there. Nobody's going to. It's not." And it just keeps growing and growing and growing for every reason that we just described. Yes. All the mechanics, all the the cool stuff. It, it's every time I open up a new maker that I've never heard of, and I see this this. And I, you know, I don't like calling them tactical knives. I've I've kind of nicknamed them myself, and I'd rather hear. I call them urban folders. Ah. Uh, because tactical sounds like it's just a, it's a weapon type of thing. Whereas mm -hmm. just an urban folder is like, you know, I'm not out on the ranch. Yes. Right. You know, this is something I can kind of conceal a little bit. I can walk around. It's, I, I live, you know, I live in Connecticut. I live in an urban area. I put it in my pocket, but I pull it out. So I like the term urban folder. Mm. Yeah. It can be a lock. It, it can be a, um, frame lock. It could be every definition of what used to be called tactical, but I just don't like that name yes. just because it's, you know, so. You'll hear me say and refer on my website, you know, he's got this urban folder. You can call it a tactical if you want, but I like, <laughs> I'm trying to make it, I'm trying to dumb it down a little bit. Well, in a sense, uh, if you think about it, uh, no one's going to use any of the folders you photograph uh, in a tactical sense. They'll, they'll get a cold steel, you know, do whatever <laughs> they need for that kind of business. And then they'll pick up their RJ Martin when they're going to the dinner party or whatever. Well, going further, um, 
I in the last probably six eight years, chefs' knives have really 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 uh, just exploded and brilliant. It's brilliant because they they're simpler they're simpler in that you, it, they, it can be a three piece knife. Uh, I've long heard that term. It's a three piece knife, two scales and a, and a, and a blade down the middle with a couple of rivets. It can be, and then they can be as intricate as imagined. Now the the key is how. How useful they are, and that every American household, every household, yes, can use a, a chef's knife. So there they are, and they're designed. What are they designed? Cut fruit, cut flesh, cut whatever. We all there's the ultimate tool. And now that the custom field has uh, has found that people are liking quality and willing to, we, we, our food is our nourishment. That we're willing to spend hundreds of dollars on a, on a single implement, a tool in the kitchen that broadens that market to nationwide. Yeah. yeah. And it's a great excuse for uh, someone who, who yeah. might be a, a closet knife guy to be like, honey, it's a kitchen knife. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. I always look at a chef's knife as, as harder to make and I'm no knife maker, but you know, you have to get them thin, 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 thin oh. and flexible and fully yeah. flat ground and, and all of that, that to me like takes, takes the skill level up. I minimize, I said, it's a simple thing. Uh, it, 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 there's a handful of makers out there rolling their eyes right now because there's uh, that thinness. It's, and I am the one, first one to know because I, I look into my hand. Oh my gosh. And so, and then they put these crazy, crazy Damascus patterns <laughs> off in the chef's steel and, and these subtle shape sculpting in the handle, very subtle sc- sculpting in the handle. And, and each one, it's, it's just, in, it's so impressive that you can, there's so many takes on uh, on on the same item, so it, it's energized this, the uh, our field. It's given a lot new, a, a lot more new people um, a chance to purchase a hand a handmade knife. And who knows? And maybe they go, you know, I got this great chef's knife. I want to get one of those urban folders. Yes, <laughs> I hear he makes urban folders. <laughs> <laughs> right. Slip joints also kind of seem like that kind of. Um, you know, the, the fact that all, all the major manufacturers have come out with their modern slip joints, to me, that's also another way to invite people who might have the knife thing in them, but not, you know, but sort of latent, invite them into the fold, you know, oh, look, it's a slip joint, like your grandfather, you know, you know that. And they're like, oh, yeah. And then suddenly people are carrying knives. It doesn't matter what they're carrying. They just need to be carrying a knife. So I don't have to loan one to them, you know? The slip joint traditional knives that uh, we like to, uh, I'd refer to that. Yeah. Um, they've become so precise, so beautiful, mm-hmm. but so friendly, so user friendly. Everybody's got grandpa's tackle box knife yeah. in their, you know, in their back pocket. And there's plenty of good production knives that are, that are cheap, but then you see these handmade ones that the makers make and they're just, you look at, you go, how did they fit those three blades in there? Mm-hmm. They're, they're ten thousands of an inch apart and they don't touch. Oh, it's, it, it, it's masterful, yeah. and so that, that's part of the appeal as well. And but but because of that that simple, very friendly, you pull out a little. It's almost like a Boy Scout knife. Oh, everybody has a Boy Scout. Knife. Click, you know? click. <laughs> ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so the traditional knives have grown largely. Chefs' knives have uh, are, are growing. Of course, uh, the urban folders have and the designs are limitless. But that's the the good old American boy. Oh. Just continues, continues to continue. Everybody's got to have a good old American because once you got a big honking buoy in your hand, you go, oh, I want one of these. God, I, I was looking through a bunch of your images and you have photographs. I'm, I'm a huge, huge Bowie fan and you have yeah, photographed some amazing, amazing Bowies. Now, there, there's just, there are just people out there making some amazing, incredible work. But I agree. Every household needs a big old boat. <laughs> you need you need at least one. And uh, there was a master smith that I I, I wish I, I've lost touch with him. I hope he's still doing well. Uh, Robin Hudson was his name. He, he retired, but I remember him saying he talked about he had like a fourteen inch buoy, and he says, well, and he had a big, and he had it, and he, and he says, I wear it all the time. And I, and I said, what do you do? Well, I can open up a bag of chips with it. I can <laughs> I can reach the top. I can reach the book at the top of the bookshelf. Um, he had all these auxiliary uses for this for this big honking buoy that had nothing to do with you know the sandbar fight. It just was <laughs> it was his tool of choice. Just a reacher and a grabber and a perky. A reacher and a grabber, yeah, and I could cut my sandwich in half, and I can open the cardboard box and 
you know, it's a, you can choke up on a big knife and make it do little tasks, but you can't make a little knife do a big task. So that's what, uh, you know, I, I, when I was in college, I worked in a kitchen and that's exactly what those guys all said. You know, there, there we, we had an array of knives that would get taken off and sharpened every week, but it was always the 10 inch regular chef's knives that, <laughs> that got dull. And I was, you know, and, and you learn very quickly, at least I did in that kitchen, like, you don't, you don't cut things with a little knife. You use the big knife, you know, you choke <laughs> up. and. So, where do you see things headed? Okay, so we've talked about the trends over the last 20 years. Where, what do you think the next trend is going to be? Or where do you think you see things in the next 20 years? Wow. Um, the pause in my voice is, is simply because I, I haven't given it that much thought. Mm-hmm. I, don't, I, mm-hmm. um, I, I can't say that I, I'm seeing – it, it'll be more of the same. I'm going to be as, just as surprised as you. Okay. Sometimes I wonder if we haven't hit peak urban folder. Well, what, we're, what I'm seeing a lot more of is is is, is singular usage of, of uh, CNC machine. When I say singular usage, uh, smaller individual guys that now they're making CNC machines affordable so a, a maker can actually put one in his own mm-hmm. studio. R.J. Martin for years uh, uh, had CNC equipment. The genius in CNC stuff is that it's it's repeatable. You can program it, mm-hmm. and and you can it's replicable. It never hand finishes a knife. It just makes the parts uh, repeatable. Right. There's so much finishing that needs doing, and the science and the smarts that it takes to amazing program any CNC well supplant the. Oh, I, I want a handmade knife. I don't want a CNC. Well, guess what? That man's got a college degree who's programming that little CNC urban folder of yours. And uh, I'm impressed with that too. So I'm never, I'm never dismayed at seeing that makers are using CNC in some form because I know that took some real smarts. And, and let's be honest, uh, handmade is a very, very deep hole. I mean, you could, yeah, man. you could say like, Oh, it has to be made with files or no, it has to be like made with emery board. Like, I, right. I, like how handmade does it have to be made? This guy thought it up, programmed this damn machine you know, had it spit out raw parts, you know, he could have done that or he could have just, uh, you know, uh, contracted that job out to a, a water jetter or whatever. Yeah, you go. There so, you go. so in a way, you know, keeping it in house is keeping it in house. We're on the same page there. Totally, totally, totally. Well, it's kind of exciting. It's like, uh, in a way, it's like, um, you know, Steven Spielberg said years and years ago, I remember reading him saying like, the next generation of filmmakers will be making them in their garage. It's going to be, you know, Young kids, and you know he was absolutely right. You know, yeah. Wow. Uh, so it's kind of the same thing. It's like people, people who, with a drive and a vision, uh, who you know who have the know how. It's uh, I think of Brian Nadeau. You know, he he does all of that out of his house. You know, he exactly he had to alter his house to fit the machine in there. Like <laughs> that is dedication. But the truth is, that's a handmade knife. And his things are amazing, man. But yeah, well, Brian's uh, Brian's a brilliant. Uh, it, it just that his his smarts and programming and and, and and skills and his attention to details and and design is is superb. You know we can't um, we can't let this conversation slip by without mentioning how forged in fire. Oh yeah, how much how important that has become to our current culture and and uh, I mean I, every time I turn around there's another maker and or blacksmith I've never heard of. And, uh, wow, are they getting involved? And then the viewers that are, uh, that are admiring this reality to yeah. it's, it's drama. We could poke holes in the show, but truth is it's doing more, more good than harm. It's the greatest television show ever created. I love, <laughs> okay. So let me tell you, Jim, uh, this, uh, let's go back, uh, 15 years. I'm on the couch with my wife watching Project Runway. Uh, it, you know, watching, watching, uh, fashion designers come up with their designs and kind of, hash through the uh, the the creative process and of course they're all stabbing each other in the back and I'm like they should make something like this but knives <laughs> my, my wife is like that'll, you know that'll be the day why don't you make that show and I'm like uh, yeah and uh, here we are and I'm grateful for that show I I gotta say I, I do I do really love that show we had um uh, we've had Jay Nielsen on the show talking about judging and also talking about his own forging yeah he does yeah. beautiful stuff uh, but what I love about it is that uh, it's still on. It's there five seasons in or so, five or six seasons in, and people are watching it. People are loving it. And to me, that's just a great sign. That just means more knife people, you know? Yeah, it, it has all the ingredients for success. It has a lot of danger involved. It has a lot of skill. It has luck. Very human element. 
it's, and it's got competition. Yeah. You know, the, we love competition. We love watching competition. Sure. And it also destigmatizes the knife itself. You know, it's not jumping out of anyone's belt and stabbing, you know. It it is it is a, 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 a an absolutely uh, essential tool and and uh, it's great to see these people putting them I together. Agree. Hey, I agree. Uh, before we wrap, you wanted me to to ask you about your logo. Tell me about the Sharp by Coop logo. It's easy to put a text watermark on any image and just say Sharp by Coop Photography or this or that. And I, mm-hmm. I do that for dealers that I I photograph for. But at some point, I wanted to um, you know just uh, I'm I'm brand aware. So I um, I reached out and I found a design company. It's called Ninety Nine Designs, mm-hmm. and uh, I I went with them. And it was a brilliant. It's an Australian company that jobs out to a, a world market. And we, I hired them. I said, I, "Here's what they asked for a portfolio. What do you want to do? What do you want to uh, you know?" And so I said, "I'm a, I, I'm a photographer. I want to show a knife." And uh, so this company called 99 designs is said okay we'll submit it and it's a contest and you choose at the end of a week which logo oh, that's want. cool i said oh okay so I, I i did the entry level the lowest budget 300 dollar logo and i was like you know in the world of logos 300 bucks i can afford to yeah it's my work i had and i'm not lying i had at the end of three days 110 different logos from 50 different artists. Wow. They're from Indonesia. They were from India. They were from England. They were from the U.S. They were from all over. Everybody spending time. My head hurt by looking at it, uh, at, at all these designs and trying to figure it all out. And finally, you know, I ended up, uh, you know, settling down and, you ha- and I, for all these people, these talented people get spent a lot of time and I had to tell, I had to tell 149 of them, no. <laughs> yeah, right. right. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. But I, I ended up working with one guy, and then you're out allowed a couple of revisions, and you say, I'd like to tell it. And but one of the things that you'll note, my my business name is Sharp by Coop Photography. What do you think about when you think about sharp? A nice pointy edge, right? Yeah, yeah. You look closely at my logo, and the, the point is buried. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. It's gone. But I love that because – that you know, it's got a camera and it's got a uh, it's got an S guard buoy, you know, the good great American buoy. Yeah. But it shoved that it's that statement that you took a knife and you went bam yeah, in deep, the table, deeply buried it in the t- it d- just buried it in the table, and it makes a statement. I'm here. This is my knife. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that statement is is uh, I, I just thought sharp or not because there were so many designs. They had a little point there or there. It was embedded in the words. Right, uh, right. Something about that one, and I, I didn't realize it until later. I don't know why I kept coming back to that. And I said, you know what? I like this one the best. And all of a sudden I realized it's the only one that doesn't have a point. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like the concept of making people kind of compete like that. And, and, you know, you get to select from that, uh, you know, that I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make some people mad and I'm going to make some people really happy because I talked to a very noted uh, graphic designer and he said, 99 designs. He said, that's, he worked for a graphics company. He said, we take our clients' work. We send it to 99designs. We pay them pennies. They come back with a bunch of And then we turn around. We show our clients. Oh, oh, <laughs> oh my God. He says, we look like heroes. <laughs> and he says, I didn't tell you that. And I was, he rolled his eyes. I said, wow. Jeez. Wow. So they have different tiers. I bought the lowest tier of three hundred dollars. You can go up to like a thousand dollars, but you really get some better graphic work. But it's still unlimited selection. So uh, that, if there's an endorsement for that ninety nine designs. So Jim, uh, what what are the first of all? I want to find out how knife makers can get in touch with you and how, how they can retain your services if it's the right fit. And and what are your um, what are your stipulations? What uh, what, what exactly do you photograph? Uh, I'm not going to send you my production ZT to photograph. What are you going to, what do you take? I'm happy to photograph that D- ZT oh, okay. every day, as long as you're willing to pay. Gotcha. You know? So, um, I, people often will sit, tell me that they, uh, I don't know if I have a, a knife uh, worthy of your skills. And it's like, uh, the only way you're going to get yourself on the map is to start to, you know, if you can't do it yourself, you got to send it to a professional. I, I, I'm glad that I'm their first choice. That said, one of my digital skills, because I work with a computer, I just literally in the last two months, I rebuilt my website so that it's mobile friendly. And uh, my my website, I own two websites, but the the one, my business website is like, I'm interested in getting an iPhotograph is sharpbycoop.com. 
dot com. And I'm so proud that I made this website uh, out of WordPress and I made it mobile friendly. It looks great oh, it on your phone. Great. And it's, it has information there. And, um, you know, I, I learned from reading about website design that said you need to have like a, a single button that says, here's where you go. Start here. Mm -hmm. And so I got a button that says, let's get started. And you click on that and that's where it takes, okay, what's the steps? Oh, first review my pricing. Then send me your information and then review my shipping. Those three. I need to, you got to know what you're up for in, in pricing mm -hmm. because it is a whole, a sword costs more than a folder. Uh, you want five prints. Uh, I'll sell them to you, but that's, this is the extra. And then I asked for, um, a form that fills out all the information from the maker and uh, about the knife. And this is what I send to the editors. And then lastly, I have all shipping guidelines because knife makers are notorious for making quality knives, but are not a shipping department. Mm -hmm. And stuff will come poking through the box, and uh, I want to give them guidelines on how to do it correctly. Right, right. Well, I, I have to say, from my perspective, when I see a, a knife maker's, uh, or when I see a picture by you, a photograph by you, and I see a, a beautiful knife, I, I got to say, I take it a little more seriously. I think uh, you know, knife makers should make themselves, uh, you know, uh, save up. If, if that's what it takes. And uh, that's definitely a great marketing tool because you look at that, you see the amazing photography that that allows you to see every detail of the blade you've worked so hard on. And then you see sharp by coop and you're like, okay, legit. Well, at least that's how I feel. <laughs> well, thank you. And and those people have stepped up. They're, they're proud of their work. It shows that they're, uh, they're, they're trying to make a stand. And, um, the good news is I, uh, you know, you've seen my, any, my Instagram is my first, uh, 103,000 followers right now. <laughs> um, and, but I make sure that I send out to 10 editors of, uh, international magazines and USA magazines. I, I'm usually covered everywhere somewhere, but my Facebook is concurrent with my Instagram. Everything that gets posted on Instagram goes on a Facebook. So, and then lastly, I, I put on, I've been, a, I've been involved with knife forms for 20 years too. I, that's how I got started with this whole thing. I, started on a knife form. Um, so stuff is going to get seen. And I, I, it's amazing in our social, in our digital life that people still the place the highest value. I, I want to see my knife in print. Hmm. I want to see it in a magazine is this amazing. Still, we hold on to that. That's, that's the Holy grail of, of, of promotion, right? It's right not there. ephemeral. It doesn't just disappear. It's there. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's real. I mean, the, the we see it on a screen and it's, it's, it's good and it is, it's valuable because maybe more people are going to buy it on the screen, but, but there's something, it's something very tactile about it. flipping the pages and seeing the, their knife in the pages of a magazine. So that's, that's totally important. Well, there you have it, everybody. Jim Cooper, Sharp by Coop. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I, I love your photography. It's been great uh, getting to know you and finding out what, uh, what drives you and what's behind these beautiful images. Bob, it's a pleasure. Thank you for reaching out to me. Uh, I love talking to people. I love the knife people. It doesn't matter who they are. Uh, it's, it's, it's so impressive. People that are interested in quality, they just like me and you. And uh, it's it's a pleasure. I'm mostly unavailable at a show. You know, people are going to go to Blades. Oh, I'd like to talk to that guy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say mm -hmm. hi. No way. I'm going to lock the door. I have got so I get so busy at a show that I have to focus. That's when my work starts. So it's it's unfortunate. I want to say hi to you viewers out there now, <laughs> because you're not going to see me then. There's a couple of gatekeepers. My wife is a gatekeeper, and Bob, if you stepped up, I'd say, "Look, Bob." Uh, I want to say <laughs> All hi right. To well, there you heard it, everybody. Uh, there you I, go. I, I will be a blade show, and I will be stepping up just for a quick moment, though. I know you got work to do. All right, Jim Cooper. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure. Cheers. Thank you so much. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Back on episode 86 of the Knife Junkie podcast, as we said, Bob, uh, interesting interview today. Not a not a knife, knife maker, manufacturer, but someone heavily and deeply involved in the knife yeah, industry. and a serious knife junkie with, with an enviable position in the knife world. You know, he has an opportunity to hold inspect and own uh, these beautiful knives from all these amazing uh, makers for a week at a time. I mean, and oftentimes that's all you need with something. And uh, I don't I don't mean to cast dispersions on on any given knife, but oftentimes I'll buy something and be like, oh, this is a great knife and I'll carry it for a week. And then 
it will reside in my collection to take up a certain role. Well, that's kind of just, um, if I could just hold and own a knife for a week, I might not, uh, you know, acquire so many and, and have so many in my collection. So he's in a very enviable position. Plus, he gets to hold, handle, and inspect knives from the top custom makers. I mean, these are knives that take, right. you know, a month to build. And he gets to to have these in his possession for a short while. And uh, to me, that's like... Um, it's like being able to go visit a, a museum with famous art in it. You know, you get to take in this work for a while. You don't have to own it and possess it, but you can you can soak it up and appreciate it and learn what you need to from it. You know, and then right. he puts it back in a in a bonded envelope yeah, and sends well, it back. Well, you know what you need to do, or you know what we What's need that? to do, or we what we need our listeners to do. They need to send you a bunch of knives, not for free. But just send you so that you can have for a week or so to do a video yeah. review, talk about here on the podcast. That way, yeah. you know, they're getting some publicity for themselves and for their knife. You're getting inventory to showcase yeah. on your YouTube channel, and then you get to scratch that itch, if well, you Well, that's right. It's like our good buddy Stu. You know, he's uh, he's got Stone and Steel up in Vermont, his, uh, his knife company, and uh, – he sent me recently the ZT0223 after he heard me, uh, you know, kind of talking sideways about it on the show. Right. And he said, check it out. You might, you might, it might change your opinion. And it most definitely did. I did a little review on it, sent it back to him, had it for a week, carried it for, for, uh, you know, the lion's share of that week. And, uh, yeah, that was a cool experience. Well, if you'd like to uh, check out some of these videos that Bob is talking about, theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. And be sure to subscribe to the Knife Junkies YouTube channel. Just go to theknifejunkie.com slash YT subscribe. Definitely, you need to be subscribed to his YouTube channel so you don't miss any of the uh, the videos. All right, Bob, that's going to wrap it up for show number 86. Final final word? Final, final, final? word is uh, just keep it sharp, man. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody, for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. For Bob, the Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the Knife Newbie Person. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.